This is the last option of Unit 5, and we will be discussing air. Air is essential for life. If you think about how long you can go without breathing, that's not very long. So compared to the different options that we have explored in Unit 5, air is one of the most important. So um, we're going to talk in this lecture about what air is made of the atmosphere. We're also going to talk about um, different cycles that go on in the air and how they're essential. And then we're going to talk about pollution and um, different types of pollution, how they're remedied, um, their impacts on air. And um, that will cover the this option for air. Um, just a reminder, for Unit 5, you need two of the four options to, to be used. Um, it doesn't matter which ones you choose. You choose whatever you want, just as long as you take those two options exams. Now, I have been getting a few questions about this. Some students want to know if they take all four options, if I'll take the two highest scores. I don't, and I don't recommend that. I really think you need to focus your efforts on two options, two options alone. Study those, study those well, take the exams, get the highest grade you can, and then focus your efforts for the final. The final is only covering units one through four. It does not cover unit five because I couldn't tell you which students studied for air and which students studied for polymers, etc. So the final exam just studies or just covers units one through four. So keep that in mind. All right, so to get started on air, we are going to talk about the layers of the atmosphere. So um, I had trouble understanding this until I looked at this picture that's in our book. So if you think of this as the surface of the earth here, and then you have your mountains here, this first layer is called the troposphere. And that's where we interact. Um, one thing that's unique to the atmosphere of the Earth is that it can support life. So the troposphere, um, what happens here is that uh, the temperature decreases with an increase in altitude. Um, the air is composed of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% argon, carbon monoxide, or sorry, carbon dioxide, and water. Okay, after the troposphere, there is the stratosphere. In the stratosphere, you have the ozone layer. So the ozone layer, um, this is where you hear about holes in the ozone due to pollution. So you hear about that. That's an important, important layer. Now the unique thing about the stratosphere is that temperature increases with an increase in altitude. After the stratosphere, there's the mesosphere. And then after that is the thermosphere. We are going to focus our attention on the troposphere. And that brings us to atmospheric pressure, which is the pressure from the weight of air. The pressure is dependent on altitude. Higher altitudes, less air, less atmospheric pressure. Okay? Units of pressure, an actual unit of pressure is an atmosphere. So one ATM is the pressure on Earth at sea level. All 
All right, tor or millimeters of mercury. This is the units of blood pressure reading. At sea level, pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. And lastly, inches mercury um, at sea level. Sorry, that just ran into one word. <laughs> at sea level, should be two words. Um, pressure is 28.82 inches of mercury. Okay, so. That brings us to something that you have probably encountered um, when traveling and cooking at, or even just looking at boxes that have cooking instructions. If you notice, like if you look at a box of brownies, there are special cooking instructions for higher altitudes. And the reason that is is because the boiling point is different at higher altitudes. So at high altitudes atmospheric pressure is lower boiling point is lowered so at high altitudes, atmospheric pressure is lowered, boiling point is lowered. So what does that mean? Well, that means if you're going to cook pasta in Colorado um, while you're skiing, that that temperature of water when it's boiling is not the same as it when it's in Kansas. So you might have to cook your pasta for longer, or you might have to cook your brownies for longer, that type of thing. Um, so at high, or sorry, at low altitudes... Atmospheric pressure is higher, boiling point is raised. Okay. So this brings us to different cycles. Um, for different components of air, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide. So nitrogen is N2. N2 has a very strong bond. So strong that nobody can break it. Nobody can break it down. So this cannot be used directly by plants or animals. Cannot be used directly by plants or animals. In order to use nitrogen, it has to be fixed or fixation. Breaking apart of nitrogen. This can be done by bacteria, lightning, or the Haber process, which is an industrial process. Okay, so I'm going to show you a picture from your textbook of the nitrogen cycle. So you have atmospheric nitrogen present, so N2, that's a big component of air. It's about 78% of air. Um, it can be fixed by lightning. It's then converted into NO2 or NO and can produce acid rain. The acid rain can water the plants um, and provide them with nitrates, fertilizers. And so then nitrates and nitrites can end up in the soil and the water. Um, another way bacteria can fix nitrogen. Um, nitrogen can be fixed by an industrial process. That's that um, Haber process. Um, it can be converted to, into NH3, which then can be used by plants and animals. Then this arrow back here, this is when plants and animals die and decay. Um, they emit 
nitrogen. They can't emit nitrogen, which so then the cycle continues. So that's the nitrogen cycle. Okay, now let's talk about oxygen. Oxygen is required for life. Your body requires oxygen to break down food and provide energy. A body breaks down food, provides energy. So plants give off O2. Animals breathe O2. Chemical reactions use O2. Okay, so it you can see how the plants give it off, the animals breathe it in. So um, if you look at this other scheme in your book. Um, this is the oxygen cycle where oxygen is present um, in the atmosphere. It's used for respiration. Um, photosynthesis um, uh, from plants and phytoplankton produce more oxygen. And um, then oxidation of metals, rusting, consumes it. Um, so the other part, um, oxygen is generated at the ozone screen. So that's more in the stratosphere, though. So that's the oxygen cycle. OK. Carbon dioxide cycle. Um, so CO2 is absorbed by oceans and plants. The CO2 is released by animals during respiration. Okay, so carbon dioxide is absorbed by oceans and plants. It's released by animals during respiration. Um, one thing I want to say about carbon dioxide, um, this can lead to, carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere can lead to the greenhouse effect, um, CO2 traps heat from Earth, so that's something that we can come across. And you might have heard of this in the news. Um, so the greenhouse effect has to do with the carbon dioxide. Instead of this heat escaping the earth, it is trapped by from the CO2. OK, let's go on to pollution. Um, It is amazing how much we have done to the Earth um, in our short time here. If you think about human existence, um, we have kind of messed up a lot of things. And um, a lot of times people def defined a pollutant as anything that humans had done. There are na natural processes that produce pollutants, so it's not just humans. Um, but we definitely do our fair share to contribute. So a pollutant is defined as a substance that can be harmful to the atmosphere. Um, so pollutants that we have observed, and a lot of the pollutants that are observed are generated because we like our electricity. And if you, I don't know if you know how electricity is typically generated in the US, uh, depending on which lectures you've listened to in Unit 4. A lot of coal is burned in the United States to heat water. The water then turns into steam. The steam turns turbines. Um, the turning of turbines produces electricity. And that's how we generate electricity predominantly in the United States. 
Well, those burning, burning of coal produces a lot of nasty things. So one of the things is sulfur dioxide, SO2, burning coal. Okay, so this can cause respiratory problems and contribute to acid rain. Another pollutant is carbon monoxide. This is emitted by motor vehicles. Um, carbon monoxide diminishes the ability to carry oxygen. Um, ozone is um, the effect of sunlight on vehicle exhaust. Lead is from battery factories. And particulates and dust can come from construction, fires, etc. So um, these particulates and dust, these are fine particles. And let me define them a little bit further. Aerosols are very small particles. They remain suspended in air for long periods of time. Particulate um, are larger physical, physical, I'm not sure what that is, larger visible particles. And these tend to settle on the surface of the earth. Okay. So um, the lead, I don't think I, lead can cause nervous system damage leading to neurological damage. Um, particulates or dust can cause breathing difficulties. Now, um, these pollutants, if they um, get carried away, like if they're, they're not trapped, that is, that is better. Sometimes an inversion can occur where a layer of cold air is trapped close to the ground. So if this layer of cold air contains pollutants, that can cause major trouble. So um, in 1952, a temperature inversion, which lasted for five days, occurred in London. 4,000 4, deaths were attributed to the pollution trapped in the atmosphere. So when you have this cold air that's more dense than the warm air above it, it's not moving anywhere. There's no wind. There's no movement whatsoever. This cold air can cause serious problems. So, um, you know, especially if it ha contains pollutants. So um, air pollution can also in occur indoors. So think about all the different paints that we have indoors and carpets. So paint carpet, um, hairspray, and pesticides can contribute to indoor pollution. So in 1907, or one more thing, this can lead to sick building syndrome. So you have to be careful with your buildings. Um, sometimes they're so well insulated that the air inside never gets exchanged with the air outside. So you have to be careful with insulation. I know, you, you know, ideally you want your homes not to be leaking energy, but at the same time you want the air quality to be good. Otherwise you get sick building syndrome. So in 1970, the Clean Air Act was passed to control air pollution from industry and automobiles, but it wasn't very comprehensive. It was amended in 1989 by George Bush Sr. 
and had a lot more um, restrictions to the Clean Air Act. Then the clean, current Clean Air Act covers most forms of air pollution. All right, so let me show you another picture. So remember I was talking about coal and how it is used. Um, we use coal to, we burn it. That burning heats water, which converts it to steam. The steam then turns the turbines, which generates the electricity. And this is what a electric power plant looks like. It's tremendous smokestacks of just stuff coming out of this coal power plant. If you've ever been to Snow Creek, um, skiing, uh, skiing not too far away from here, it's not in Colorado, but um, Snow Creek has a power plant very close to it. And it almost like when you're skiing there, if you look out and you say, oh my gosh, these clouds are coming in. There's a storm coming in. No, it's not a storm. It's just billowing clouds of um, exhaust from this coal power plant. And um, then if you happen to look around, you notice these trains. These, you know, my kids love trains. And so they just go nuts. Well, these trains are covering or ca carrying tons and tons of coal to this power plant because the, every day this power plant consumes so much coal. So the reason coal is burned is because we all like our electricity. And when you pay your electricity bill, you, you are paying for the burning of coal and all that, that operation of that huge deal. Um, so, you know, if you can think of alternative forms of electricity or forms of energy to get the electricity, like solar power, solar panels. Um, the other alternative, like I especially think of this in Kansas, is wind. Wind energy using um, what seems to be so abundant, wind. So um, let me read this little caption because it, it, is, it has a lot of information in it. Burning of coal and electric power plants and other industrial operations is the main source of industrial smog, characterized by high levels of sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, and sometimes carbon monoxide. Industrial smog can be alleviated by the use of electric, electrostatic precipitators, scrubbers, and other devices. Okay, so industrial smog is formed by the combustion of coal, coal and oil. It has several components, um, sulfur dioxide, sorry, I put sulfur trioxide, um, particulate matter, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. So the ways that we can treat smog, electrostatic, precipitators, so this will reduce the pollution, scrubbers, this will reduce the um, particulate matter, and then filtration. All of these ways to reduce industrial smog are very expensive. So, you know, if you think about if you can reduce the amount of electricity you use, you're reducing your dependence on coal. Um, these solar panels have really taken off in the past 10 to 15 years. They're a lot cheaper than they used to be, and it's a lot easier for people to generate electricity without having to be on the grid, if that makes sense. Okay, and lastly, we're going to talk about photochemical smog. Um, photochemical smog is, occurs when sunlight initiates reactions to create air pollution. Sunlight initiates reactions to create air pollution. So the components of photochemical smog are NO, NO2, NO3, sometimes they're just abbreviated NOx, ozone, which is O3, um, and then carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons, um, which can be called volatile organic compounds. 
or VOCs. Um, so these uh, can be gasoline and sometimes from the decay of plants. The majority of all these pollutants that make up photochemical smog are produced by car engines and diesel powered engines. Car engines, diesel powered engines. And if you think about uh, when you go fill up your car with gasoline or if you have a diesel engine, either one, um, these organic compounds, gasoline and diesel, they evaporate pretty readily. They, um, and when they evaporate into the air, they're contributing to photochemical smog. So if you can pump your gas at a time when the temperature's cooler, that's much better. Um, pump smouts have been redesigned to not allow that evaporation so much, but you're definitely going to reduce the amount of evaporation that occurs if you go fill up at times when it's not so hot. So ways to treat photochemical smog, catalytic converter, we all have these in our cars, um, so you decrease the VOCs, decrease the carbon monoxide, um, these both get converted into CO2 by your catalytic converter. Uh, and I was just talking about this, the redesign of pump spouts, gasoline pump spouts. So this concludes our lecture on air. I hope it's made you think about how we interact with our world and um, chemistry is everywhere and you know when you take a breath of air think okay that that's good I'm glad that it's not polluted I'm glad you know grateful for that um, but there's a lot of chemistry around us and if you are always thinking about how you can reduce your impact um, on the earth that is far better for our future generations. Um, you know, I don't know if that much was known about coal when we started developing these coal, um, these electric power plants that produce a ton of pollution. So um, always something to think about. Um, I hope these Unit 4 or Unit 5 lectures have been informative to you and maybe make you think differently about how you interact with chemistry on a daily basis. I've enjoyed doing them for you and I hope that you have enjoyed this course. Please let me know if you have any further questions. I'd be glad to answer them for you. Take care.